Thank you very much. And speaking of my publications, most of you uh, are old timers. You've been around a little bit. You've seen some of my books, but I brought two this table right here. If you'd like to take a look, one is a history of these neighborhoods right here in Seattle. The other is uh, co author with David Berge, my old friend, a history of religion in the state of Washington. All the various sects, groups, churches, and so forth, and uh, it won a award. I also brought with me a portrait, which is up here in front, of Diesel. Who is that? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. I'm talking about the plants and animals of Lewis and Clark. But it stemmed stem from something called the Enlightenment. Enlightenment was a kind of a movement in Western countries, mostly in Europe, mostly in Scotland, in the uh, early 1700s, that wanted to move away from a fiefdom, a serfdom, a slavery, just working the land for somebody else. They wanted to take their, their time to participate and be recognized as human beings. It was Jefferson, to a great extent, who, at least in the United States, borrowed and got engaged with this movement in Europe, which, as I say, mainly came from Scotland. The Scottish uh, educational system, by the way, has always been one of the best in the world. Uh, far back, some of the best universities, University of Edinburgh and so forth, for medical studies and so forth, is top rated. Jefferson, who was tutored as a child, uh, on Albemarle County, Virginia, learned a couple of things in his very young life. One was not only the three R's basics, but he learned from one of his uh, tutors that you can't trust the British. That stuck, that stayed. The second thing he met or learned, I should say, one of his uh, tutors was that the future of the United States of America is in the West. Go west, go west. Jefferson believed that democracy, which he fervently believed in, even though there's an aristocratic background to him and sometimes there's suspicions because he had slaves as did all the people at that time. Never mind, he believed that future in a democracy meant people must meet, disagree, agree, come up with a decision, and move on. Jefferson, uh, not only took advantage of his views in that regard with his own staff, with his own people, but he hired a young uh, uh, assistant, you might say, uh, in his presidency, the first presidency, and uh, his name was Mary Wendell Lewis. Lewis, in turn, later on in the second administration of Jefferson, hired a man named Clark, William Clark. But Lewis was a surrogate son of Jefferson. Lewis lived, if you, if you want to put it that way, camped out, resided, but right next to Jefferson's library in the president's house, Washington, D.C. And Jefferson encouraged him uh, to read the books, take his time, to enjoy what was there, and Lewis did so. Lewis became a disciple, if that's the right word, of the Enlightenment that Jefferson believed in and was pursuing in a modest way, and also believed in keeping records. Jefferson got up every morning, got on his horse, went to, uh, and examined the nail factory. He had a nail factory on the top of that hill, by the way. Monticello was called the Little Mountain. He also had slave porters. He always referred to his slaves as quote, servants, but they were slaves. He also took the temperature, examined the books. He went out to look at the various products that were growing in various fields, including a vegetable garden that was called the richest. And he did it every single morning. He was a creature of habit, but it was habit that helped preserve not only his holdings and his lifestyle, but satisfied him as a student of the Enlightenment. Now, when the decision was made, because the Spanish were out here, the British were out here, the Russians were edging down from the north, 
looking at where we are right now, the Great Pacific Northwest, Jefferson said to himself and to others, we've got to get in this game because this is part of the great Northern American continent and the United States is moving in that direction. Some of that movement in that direction, by the way, was unfortunate, Jefferson, despite the fact that uh, he had uh, high hopes for the native populations, he wasn't the least bit reticent about moving native groups off their land to make room for Euro-American groups to come on. It was a great tragedy. It happened, but Jefferson's time was the time. It was the Euro-American group or race or people who were gonna move across and make the United States huge and powerful country to compete with Britain, Russia, and Spain. So that's more or less the background. So when Mary Lewis was asked to go west and see what was out here, the only information he had, the only data that was reliable were mountain men, a few travelers, a few adventurers, uh, a couple of people on horseback and some natives who came to visit him in the, in the president's house. By the way, it was called the president's house uh, up until Teddy Roosevelt's time. And that's when we use the term White House. But up to that point, it was the president's house. And so in order to take advantage of this, he said to Meriwether Lewis, a very bright young man, he was 28 at the time, uh, and he hired his boss, by the way, uh, later on, uh, William Clark, who was 33. That was young, they were young guys, but they were experienced. They'd both been in the service. They both had been officers. They both had been captains, even though Clark was the leader and the boss of Lewis when they were in the service, it reversed under Roosevelt, uh, excuse me, under uh, Jefferson because of Jefferson's close relationship with Lewis. The first thing that Jefferson said was, besides read my books, talk to me, find out all you can with the knowledge at hand about the West. He also said that uh, there would be scientific backup, what he was gonna do. He didn't have to worry about the nitty gritty and the scientific aspects. There'd be people who would help like Dr. Benjamin Barton. Benjamin Barton was a site of the Declaration of Independence and a friend of Jefferson's. And Barton was going to take care of the scientific detail that they brought back from the trek to the West. The unhappy ending to that effort, by the way, was that Benjamin Barton died before the journals were completed and the scientific stuff kind of just stayed out there for about over six or seven years before it was collected and put into the journals. Now, a word about the journals. This is a written record. Lewis and Clark both helped write it as they went. They had some kind of paper products and a kind of a new product that Jefferson himself helped develop to enclose and, to, and to seal off the work they were doing. Sometimes they used the bark of trees. Sometimes they used little bitty notes. They called them field notes. And then when they got to various campsites along the way, such as Fort Plaza and the Columbia River, they hunkered down by candlelight and they wrote out in detail what they had seen, what they had learned on their trip out here. The trip west took six months. The trip back east after they had done their job, so to speak, took two months. They wanted to get home. They'd seen everything, they recorded everything. But coming out, yes. Yes, they were on the run. But keep in mind, interestingly enough, the rivers uh, that they were going back on were flowing eastward. And so when they were coming westward, they were paddling along eddies, pulling the boats over their shoulder with uh, ropes, handmade ropes, by the way, from uh, plants that they found along the way to a great extent. So it was a little easier run. And besides, they knew the return route. They didn't have a clue where they were going when they came out, except for just bare bones stuff. Very rough, very rough. The other thing I want to mention about the journals is that it's one of the most important documents in American history. It's not literary, and the spellings are hilarious. Uh, the syntax, 
the rest of it is uh, sometimes scrambled all over the place, but the record is there every single day, if you can believe it, every day. I rarely miss today. Sometimes I just said, we set up camp, we found a good, uh, a good uh, deer, uh, we, we got a fish out of the water, and uh, so and so cooked it, and then they go to the next day. But they were at least kept record. And in this organization, listening to the board meeting today, we're trying to do the same. Keep records, make it accurate, make it available, make it readable. In any case, at Fort Clatsop, which was their third winter camp, they sat down. Have, they, have any of you been to Fort Clatsop? Okay, good. Several of you have. It's well worth it, uh, visiting, even though it's the third version. It's based on drawings that they did. The floor plan, at least, is based on drawings that they did. So you really see something quasi-authentic. Uh, the first one just brought it away. The second one when they, that they built with the help of local people uh, stood until a fire occurred about uh, six years ago, seven years ago, and burned poor wood. Then they redid it again. This is the third version of Fort Clatsop. But their job, the captain's job, was to write all of it down, get it down on the record, which they did. And then they took that record back east and uh, said, Mr. President, look what we have. The president was exuberant, excited. He was a scholar. He was a researcher himself. He was a detailed guy. And this was right down his alley. And I'm going to expose just a little bit of this to give you a flavor of what these uh, gentlemen did. When they got the Fort Clatsa, it was Lewis who did most of the writing. And uh, he used 200 terms that he got from various botanical books that he brought along. I gave a talk one time on the, the books uh, uh, that they brought with them. A couple of my very good friends, scholars, all of them, questioned that they brought along a library with them. They did, they did. I'll give you some examples. Dr. Barton's books, Elements of Mineralogy, the illustration of the sexual system of Linnaeus, Linnaeus, famous Swede, who said both plants and animals and humans are divided by male and female parts. And you can tell what is what because of the looking at the stems and looking at the leaves and looking at the buds and so on. So that was amazing. They had that with them. And they had a four volume dictionary of arts and sciences. So even though they were in this dark candlelit place at Fort Plaza in 1801, uh, 1804 actually is when they got there, they, 1801 is when they started, they got the job done, they wrote it out. Now, I'm gonna start with a couple of examples and I'm going to read just a few words from the journals of how these two men describe what they saw and claim to have discovered, now, you know and I know, but the natives had already discovered everything here, had eaten, uh, made, the, made the bones into tools, uh, had trained some of the animals like uh, wolves and other things to herd for them. Uh, they used the elk horns and other things for instruments. So they knew quite a bit, but to the two young Americans in their team, it was quote, a discovery, a discovery. This first picture is a bighorn sheep. You can see this today. If you go up to the Snake River, uh, where I go, or used to go a little bit on small cruise boats and give talks, well, they come right down to the water. I won't say they're tame, but they're pretty used to a boat or, or people marching around in their various areas. It doesn't bother them, but also they're quite good sized. They're strong. And no one's gonna bother them because they jump from one little place to the next. I'll give you an example. Uh, keep in mind that these brief quotations I'm going to give you were written by two men who probably between them barely had what we would call a high school education. One of them was probably a junior high. Uh, that would have been uh, Clark, quite frankly. Lewis had a little more. He would have been maybe a sophomore in high school. That's just a rough feeling for you. But when you hear what they wrote and tried very hard to describe things they'd never seen in their lives before, uh, it will surprise, it will surprise you. This is near uh, Musselshell River, Montana. And they saw these places, by the way, several of these uh, animals in different places, but they 
they quote some of the best quotes. I'll give you with a, a, a source. It said here that Drewer killed a male, 27 pounds, head and horns remarkably large. These animals you're looking at right here, big horn sheep, feed on grass, but principally grow on the aromatic herbs which grow on the cliffs at inaccessible heights. They bound from rock to rock and stand in the most careless manner, very shy and are quick. That's not bad, huh? For a young fella, never having seen him before. Here's a pretty flower. It's called the bitterroot, also called the Luisia, or Mary with a Lewis, Luisia red of Eva. It's from the rock rose family. Bitterroot Mountains are named for this fly, for this flower, Bitterroot Mountains. It's now the Montana State Flower, and it's the most celebrated of all the plants brought back by Lewis and Paul. Here's an interesting fellow, Stellar's J. Stellar's J. The story of Willem Stellar is another story having to do with Alaska. Don't go into all that, but uh, he had identified this boat, uh, uh, this bird, and pointed out that it was only uh, available or could be seen or appreciated in the North American continent, which means not in Asia, not in Asia, which is how he separated the two great land masses there. This was spotted by Lewis in what is today Idaho, it's not called Idaho then, of course, and he said this, the whole of the body, including the upper disc of the tail and wings, are of a fine, glossy, bright indigo blue. They have four toes, Sharp tail. Stellar's J. The bobcat, also called a tiger cat. Now, for a number of years, I've seen this. Yes. That's right. They did, especially Clark. He was a pretty good uh, artist. Lewis did some too. And they didn't sketch every animal I'm showing you. These were uh, done, and I paid to have these done by a Montana wildlife photographer. Yeah, I thought you ought to have the benefit of the best. Yes. Sir. Yeah, right. The tiger cat, they didn't kill them, but they noticed the Indians took their lives and used them for belts and for scarves. So they were impressed. Now I thought for a long time, as I was just about to say, that a bobcat is our local cougar or puma. No, it's in between. It's in between a large ha house cat and a cougar. It's a mid-sized feline. And we don't, you're not, probably not going to see them. And they saw very, very few of them, very rare. But they nevertheless recorded it. And here's what Clark wrote, William Clark, near the Willamette River, which is south of Portland, as you well know. He saw a row formed of three skins of the tiger cat. The tiger cat is found on the borders of the plains and the woody country along the Pacific Ocean. Only one was killed, and this was by natives who showed this to them. Camas, sometimes called Quamash from the Lily family. This was in Nez Perce country, which is Idaho, northern Idaho. By the way, the Nez Perce Indians played a very big role in the Lewis and Clark effort. They helped them, gave them food. They were almost going to die there. They were so sick and had terrible times. The Nez Perce stepped forward. They could have killed them all, taken their rifles and pots and pans and uh, knives, but didn't do it. So the Nez Perce role is a very, very important one of the Lewis and Clark trip. Near the Weite Prairie, that's Idaho, 30 bushels were steamed by the Indians at this particular plant, by the way. 
in a pit covered with three inches of grass. The men got very sick. It caused gastroenteritis at the canoe camp and with dried salmon, which may have been tainted. We don't know this. They didn't know this. Several men got sick. Lewis got sick. They complained of heaviness in the stomach. These are the exact words, by the way, of Clark. Several men so unwell that they were compelled to lie on the side of the road. Well, the men's purse cut away from that. So the story is interesting that even though it's a beautiful plant, there are two varieties of it. One is toxic. Maybe that was it. The other is not toxic. And maybe they ate some of the toxic ones. We don't know, but it's a possibility. Parkia, the ragged robin. Parkia. First glance, the flowers appear to have been torn to ribbons. Bright pink, purplish hue. And uh, Clark, excuse me, Lewis goes on to say, it grows on the steep sides of the fertile hills. The radix is fibrous, not much branched, annual, woody, white, and nearly smooth. The filaments are very short, white and smooth. The limb is four cleft saucer shaped and the margins of the lobes entire and rounded. For goodness sakes, this is a, a fellow with a, a junior high school education describing this under the shadow, under the direction, if you will, of Thomas Jefferson from afar. Get it all down. Make it all live. Make it work. Clark's Nutcracker. It's on the Panhandle of Idaho again. Uh, and I, today, this is Clark writing in journal. Today, I saw a bird of the woodpecker kind which fed on the pine birds. Its bill and tail was white, the wings black, every other part of a light brown, and about the size of a robin. This carcass, by the way, was saved, sent back down the uh, Missouri River. And uh, Jefferson actually saw the carcass, which was terribly exciting to Jefferson. Evidence of something brand new in science that he didn't know about. Not very exciting. These are currents. What's so big about currents? Well, I'll tell you what's important about currents. These various currents, some of them are black, purple, yellow, and so forth, were unknown on the East Coast of the United States at that time. What did they do with them? They brought the seeds back, gave them to Jefferson. Jefferson dried the seeds, put them in packets, and sent them to colleagues in his scientific endeavors in London, in Paris, and in Washington. They planted them, and they grew. Well, that doesn't sound terribly exciting, because most of you are gardeners, and we all grow up with things growing around us. This is a big deal for these currents. Also, you can make a jam out of this if you can release the toxicity. There's a tendency to have part of the toxic. Plain old currents. This is called a monkey flower, and for the life of me, I cannot understand why. I've looked at it from all angles, very close. I keep thinking I'll see a tail of a monkey, uh, one of the lobes, uh, uh, or a face of a monkey in the, in the blossom, but I can't locate it. But it's called the monkey flower, and it's known. Lewis had described it in uh, Three Forks, Montana, where the three rivers came together to create the Missouri, going back to the Mississippi. He said the area was near a place called Beaverhead, and Beaverhead's very important to the story of Lewis and Clark, because that's where Sacagawea came from. And Sacagawea, when she got to the Beaverhead area, which was a big stone monument shaped like a beaver's head, she said, oh, this is where I was kidnapped. This is where I've been. I know this, this part, of the, part of the world. That was very exciting. A monkey flower just represents the area. That was. This is called a mule deer. Why? Take a close look. Why would it be called a mule deer? Ears. Look at the ears. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's kind of cute. Clark in South Dakota, and also on the Yellowstone River, a couple of places, they named it for the long to ears and tail. They said it's larger than the common deer, 
a circular spot, perfectly white, which occupies a part of the rump and extremities of the buttocks. The tail is nine to 10 inches long, lives in level, fertile, partially covered country with timber. My goodness sakes. Well, you can see these, and I've seen these when I've been on motor coaches or even driving in uh, Nez Perce country, which is Eastern Washington, Idaho, Western Montana. They're, they're plentiful. They're around. Now, the mule deer was very important for another reason. See those antlers? You can use for tools, used to build things, used to shape things. They can eat the flesh. They can take the skin, wrap it around them, and go to bed at night. Or make a suit and clothes or make moccasins. Very valuable in terms of Lewis or Clark fly. This is the Oregon grape, just about as common as you can find. Nothing dramatic or exciting about the Oregon grape, except it was called Mountain Holly by Lewis and Clark. It was found in the Grand Rapids of the Columbia River. And they describe it, this is Lewis's words in the journals. They're evergreen shrubs. They grow in rich, dry ground not far from some water course. The Oregon grape, he noted, was from a foot to 18 inches high and is simple, unbranched, and erect. This today is Oregon State Flower. Named because Lewis and Clark, quote, discovered it and described it. Well, this is a Amazing sight, and I don't know if any of you have ever been up a snake, especially the snake or parts of the Columbia. Uh, even on the Willamette, you can see the pelicans. They knew a lot about the pelicans because they, like everybody, everything else, they killed them, ate them, examined them, looked carefully. And what did they do with this fellow? They poured five gallons of water into his lower mandible. Five gallons. Now we know the potential pelican has of holding food in the lower mandible and continuing for the rest of the day or maybe two days, eating as he or she felt like it, because the food was trapped in the lower mandible. They were seen in several locations. I've seen them a number of times. This was Audubon's favorite American bird, by the way, just as a, a sidelight. The prairie dog, sometimes called the barking squirrel. The story with this fella is fascinating. They were everywhere, of course, in the Dakotas and in Montana. How did they capture this guy? Well, you poke his or her head up, around, and then you go towards him, he or she would duck, and then you poured water into his hole and kept pouring water and kept pouring water until they go, Ugh! Came up the air and you grab it. That's how they captured these falls. Well, the interesting thing about this guy is they actually caught several, kept them alive, and one was shipped in a cage or a little pen to Jefferson, and it was in the president's house. Jefferson saw a live prairie dog from the hands of Lewis and Clark. I can imagine Jefferson was out of his mind, so excited to see a living thing come back from this great trip. This is called the prickly pear. And uh, I was talking to my friend Tom about this a little bit. In this area, they had, by the way, one of the most amazing experiences. They had an 18 mile portage. Think about that 18 miles. Everything being hauled, grabbed, carried, 18 miles. And they would step on this guy and go, wow. They were you're trying to get through this place. There were three great falls there partially a fourth one, and the prickly pear became their nemesis, their enemy, so they never forgot it and they described it. But also it's where Lewis and Clark came across the grizzly bear. They knew about bears, the old black bear, girl, they run from you usually, not a grizzly. And the natives said to him, some are honey colored, they didn't use that term, light tan, some are black, some are blonde, some are brown. And at first, Lewis and Clark thought they were several different kinds of bear. But the natives said, no, they're all the same. Their grizzly stayed away. Well, one, one grizzly chased Lewis full speed 
into the river. Lewis jumped into the river, turned around and held a spear he had with him. And the bear said to himself, I guess, I don't want to get wet the hell of it, and walked away. But it was a close call. They learned a lot about the bear. But the prickly pear was where they first saw the pears, where they first saw this particular harmful plant, and where they had 18 miles of hiking to get across uh, and keep on moving west. Pronghorn. Looks like any number of uh, uh, animals uh, and the sheep or the, uh, the other uh, uh, types of uh, horned animal, but it's different. Pronghorn is unique to the North American continent, and it's been looked at very carefully by scientists who said it only grows in North America. A Clark described, quote, I killed a buck goat of this country. The horns are not very hard. Color is a light gray with black behind its ears, down its neck, and its jaw, jaw white round its neck. It has only a pair of hooves to each foot. Longhorn. Another source, by the way, of food for the Lewis Park trip. American elk, familiar? They're around. This is not a surprising animal, but a very important one. It's also called Rocky Mountain, and sometimes it's called Roosevelt now, and that's for Teddy, by the way, not, not uh, any other Roosevelt. Here's what Clark wrote on the Missouri River when they spotted this, and they spotted it more than just the place on the Rock River. They are in much better order near the prairies than the woody country. They feed on grass and rushes. They're not meat eaters. They just, anything that's on a tree, they'll chop on. In the woods country, their food is huckleberry bushes, fern, and an evergreen shrub. You call that salal, I think. Food and clothing source. The natives use small dogs, by the way, to hunt these animals. The natives train their dogs to herd around and frighten and push them into a corner, and then they attack them. So the dogs, which were tame, which were part of the Indian culture, helped capture these guys. This is called a syringa. Uh, Lewis is the one that first described this. It's now the state flower of the state of Idaho. Very pretty, very, so very important because Lewis talked to the ones that allegedly found it and described it in detail. Question around, Corey, don't worry about them. We found out that uh, they were not that dangerous. They're just as afraid of you as you are of them. I've had some experience with the rattlesnakes in the state of Georgia now as well. And by the way, the rattlesnake meat isn't bad. It tastes like chicken. I've had a couple of bites of it. But the rattlesnake uh, has an interesting story in the Lewis Park business. There was a uh, incident when uh, Sakaga Wea was going to join the group, she was about 16 years old, she was pregnant, about to give birth, and she was in great discomfort. And a man named Rene Jusson, a French fur trader, came in the campsite and said, I can help, find me a rattlesnake. They went out and killed a rattlesnake, they cut off the rattle, mixed it in a cup of water, Sakaga Wea drank it, and 10 minutes later, she gave a smooth. Now, they were there to witness it. It's later been surmised that maybe there was an additional effect, a good one, uh, in a rattlesnake's tail, but it's hard to believe. But Rene Jusson, who lived all his life among the natives, uh, was the one that came up with this. Now, why do I show a picture of a plain old cutthroat trout? Here's the reason why. On many of the streams, they found salmon. But if you recall, I mentioned earlier that when they came over the, the some of the mountains, the Bitterroot Mountains, they got very sick, fell down, fell off their horses, growing up weak. So they preferred not to eat salmon, if you can believe this, even though they were surrounded by one of the greatest fishes that ever lived, they preferred to go for a trout. So their meal was trout much of the time. 
Here's what Lewis wrote near the Great Falls of Montana. These were caught in the falls, 16 to 23 inches. They resemble the mountain or speckled trout. I was uh, in my prime, so to speak, across the Olympic Peninsula with a friend, nine days on the trail. Every single day we ate this fish. We boiled it, we cooked it, we, we grazed, grazed it. We even so we ate some chunks raw, but it's there and uh, it keeps you alive. Lewis went on to say, they have generally small dash of red on each side behind the front ventral fins, the flesh is of a pale yellowish red or when in good order of rose red. Does all look familiar? Wolf, the gray wolf and the white wolf. Not to worry. In the view of Lewis and Clark, this animal is not dangerous to human beings. Experimental, they'll bite, they'll put their nose in, uh, and they might uh, want to take advantage of uh, somebody who is very sick or weak or unable to keep up. But generally speaking, they're not dangerous. And here's what they wrote We find little support for their legendary viciousness with respect to man. However, one night, a wolf bit Sergeant Nathaniel Pryor through his hand when he was asleep and attempted to seize Richard Windsor, another member of the party, when George Shannon, he was the youngest member of the party, by the way, got up, took his gun, and shot the wolf. Now, the wolves, not only you could eat them, not only were they kind of roving garbage collectors, they cleaned up everything in a the camp. They also provided wonderful skins, furs, for clothing. And on that note, I thank you very much for joining me, and I'd be glad to stay a minute if you have a question or two. Yes. Okay. The what? Yes. Isn't that something? You don't think it is? It's a good story. Would you like to tell more about it? Come on up. Would you like to tell more about the grizzly bear? You want to come up? Yes, Teresa. Good question. Many of them, not all, uh, many of them are kept in a, a Kentucky museum. Some are in the American Philosophical Society, which is in Washington, D.C. You have special permission to get in there and use that. And a couple uh, remnants, maybe, are at Monticello, Jefferson's home in Virginia. You cannot look at the originals, but many copies have been made. The, the journals today uh, come to about 14 volumes because they've added all the scientific stuff, which Lewis and Clark just had little bits and pieces of. 14, 13 or 14 volumes. The original ones that they brought back were about four, came to about four. Yeah, well, it was a Kentucky museum that uh, uh, I forget the name of it, that was focused on trips west in Western America. Any other, any other question? Okay, I have a couple of books over here if you'd like.